You know, the myocardial infarction is only just slightly over 100 years old in terms of us even knowing about it. There is no coronary artery disease in the Ebers papyrus in Egypt. There is no uh, acute myocardial infarction in Hippocrates. Hippocrates never even heard of coronary artery disease. There's no acute coronary syndrome in the Book of the Yellow Emperor, from which we get artesanates and artemether, a Nobel Prize winning level of work. The myocardial infarction is a product of the American ability to eat meat on a daily basis basis. Prior to 70 or 80 years ago, the average American would eat meat once a month or once a week at most. Not ever has there been the idea of having us be in danger of our own fat asses. And that's why things like looking at the survival of stable angina, no beta blockers? Ah, Aspirin for everybody with angina, aspirin for everybody with coronary disease. But look at the benefit on mortality when you have beta blockers. Nitrates is only for pain, but look at this beta blocker. The beta blocker was designed on purpose in the 1950s by James Black, the same guy. The same guy that invented H2 blockers. There's never been any inventor of medications other than this guy who invented two major classes, H2 blockers, ranitidine, famotidine, nizatidine, cimetidine, and the beta blocker. But let's look at that spread, man. That is fantastic in terms of the beta blocker. Now, beta blockers were considered contraindicated in congestive failure from the 1950s all the way into the 90s. For 40 years, even James Black himself said, don't be using beta blockers from congestive failure. They're negative inotropes. You're going to kill somebody. We all know that congestive failure, you got to give a positive inotrope like digoxin. And isn't that the paradox of things? The positive inotrope like digoxin doesn't lower mortality in anything. And the negative inotrope like the beta blocker lowers mortality all over the place. ACE inhibitors and angiotensin receptor blockers lower mortality as long as there is a low ejection fraction, otherwise known as systolic dysfunction. If they're both in the same choice, which one are you going to choose? Because they both have the same ability to be afterload reducers and to work in systolic dysfunction. ACE inhibitors are always first. Even though ARBs are very good drugs for blood pressure, even though a ARBs do lower mortality and systolic dysfunction, ACE inhibitors always have an edge against them. The second thing is, when do they get used in combination? You think, hey, let me block the production of angiotensin. Let me block the target organ effect. Now, if this was step one of USMLA, step one would have a big deal about that. Step one loves, you know, does it block the amount or does it block the effect? But clinically, they don't have any significant uh, additive abilities. So they're never combined. Even though you think, hey, the mechanism, they should be combined. One, you block the production of angiotensin. Two, you block the target organ effect. Combine them. Doesn't work. Always wrong. Now, ACE inhibitors and ARBs both produce hyperkalemia. ACE inhibitors produce a cough by increasing bradycarnins. I doubt the last key because that's too easy. Now, if you use, have a cough with the ACE inhibitor, which is about 7%, you'll switch to an ARB, low sartan, val sartan, herb sartan, candesartan, sartan, val sartan, herb sartan, candesartan, low sartan, val sartan, herb sartan, candesartan. So there's a class effect except for one thing, which is the one to use in gout. <gasps> low sartan. Low sartan is the one to use in gout. <laughs> So if both ACE inhibitors and ARBs cause hyperkalemia, what are you going to use for afterload reduction if both of them are causing hyperkalemia and you have hyperkalemia? You have two answers. One, if you're having an intractable hyperkalemia. So you have a drug like these that lower mortality, and you've got to use some afterload reduction. So you can answer hydrolazine combined with nitrates. Hydrolazine combined with nitrates will lower mortality, and acts as an afterload reducer, hydrolazine with nitrites. Now that's the only time that nitrates actually lower mortality, but not alone, with, nit with hydrolazine. The other answer is you add patiromer, patiromer, 
Look it up. Go to Wikipedia. Pteromer is an oral calcium, potassium, calcium, potassium exchange resin. It's kind of like KX Lite, but in a pill, so you can use it all the time. So Pteromer is a game changer. I've got diabetes and hypertension, and I want to prevent the progression of my renal failure with diabetes and hypertension, with diabetes and proteinuria. ACE inhibitors and ARBs block the, prevent, uh, block the progression of that disease. Oh, damn, I'm getting some hyperkalemia. What are you going to do? Stop the drug that prevents mortality? Stop the drug that prevents the progression of renal insufficiency? No. Treat the complication. Pteromer. So antiangital medications, what is ranolazine? Now, USMLE is not going to get you into a specific area for something like ranolazine. All they're going to want you to know is that this sodium channel medication is an anti-angital medication. It's not clear that it lowers mortality, and it's one of those drugs that's going to be, hey, you're on all the other medications, you're on the aspirin, the beta blockers, the nitrates, you're on everything else, but you're still having pain. Well, the first thing should be revascularize. Revascularize. The concept of just letting people have angina, take some nitrates sublingually when you have angina, that's an old concept. That concept that was used to be in the uh, 20s, 30s, 50s, 60s, used to say, take your little nitroglycerin, and if you have chest pain, take some nitrates. And it would be anti-anginal. We're not crazy about that, because if you have persistent angina, your answer should be use a bunch of medications and revascularize. So we'll always say you've maxed the meds, and revascularization is either failed to relieve the pain or can't be done. Either failed or can't be done. Renolazine as an extra anti-anginal. Okay, you still have chest pain. Hyvabradine. Ivabradine is a great drug because it's got a unique adverse effect. Ivabradine is a special thing called a funny channel. What's funny about the funny channel? The funny channels are in what part of the heart? The funny channels are in nodal tissue. So the funny channels are funny sodium channels, and they're called funny or strange because sodium channels almost everywhere in the body except for nodal tissue, AV and SA node, AV, SA node, AV node, and the conduction system, the places that have automaticity. Well, sodium channels are either closed, then open for one to two milliseconds, then closed. And closed, closed, we're closed, open for a millisecond, then closed. But in nodal tissue, they're called funny because the reason that they have automaticity is it has a slow depolarization, then depolarizes. Slow depolarization, then depolarizes. That's funny, man. You mean it's like sort of partially open? Yeah. Oh, well, that's strange. Everywhere else, sodium channels and nerves are closed until they're open, and then they're closed again. But here, they're sort of partially open. That's funny. Ivabradine is a funny channel inhibitor and it is an add-on for medication for both congestive failure, both congestive failure and coronary disease. Ivabradine, if you have all the other meds on and you still have pain or symptoms and the Ivabradine will slow the heart rate or you're on all the beta blockers and you still have a fast heart rate. So who gets bypass surgery? Who's going to get, and this is coronary angiography, ultimately, is that the need determines the need for who gets to bypass surgery. You don't need the angiography to tell me you got ischemic disease. You can do that with a stress test, and it tells you whether or not you need this, the, angi the angioplasty versus the bypass because it will show whether or not you have three vessel disease or a left main. The stress test can show the reversible ischemia. Boom. Watch, this is so cool. Isn't that great? It's nice, right? Let's see it again. <laughs> yeah, there's contrast going in there. But what if you have renal insufficiency? Not contrast to kill you. I mean, damage kidneys. Damage kidneys, which kill you. So what am I going to cast for? If I have a renal insufficiency, what am I going to cath for? If I'm an old person with coronary disease and I already know there, I'm going to cath to be able to determine bypass criteria. Now, I bypass and I have two mammary arteries, I have two internal mammary arteries, and I have these saphenous veins. So what's the difference between the saphenous and the internal mammary? They both need aspirin and beta blockers. 
Neither of them gets warfarin. Warfarin and the heart do not meet. Warfarin is not used for coronaries ever. Warfarin and the heart don't meet. The difference is that the internal mammary arteries last longer. They last for 10 years. So saphenous grafts last for five years and internal mammaries can last for 10 years. Now, when people talk about bypass, they go, oh my God, I had triple bypass. I had quadruple bypass, triple bypass, quadruple bypass, as if there was somebody getting single bypass. There's no such thing as single bypass. Every bypass is always triple bypass or quadruple bypass because single vessels should not be bypassed. You either just use medications or you'd angioplasty them. So let's look at the difference in mortality benefit between these two procedures. The great age of bypass surgery in the 1960s, 70s, and 80s was before we had ACE inhibitors. There was no ACE inhibitors, there was no ARBs in the 60s and 70s, and the statins didn't come out until the end of the 80s. So you bypassed people because we didn't have the right meds. So left main disease or three vessels, how much of a percentage of stenosis in each one to be significant is about 70%? Or two vessels in a diabetic or two vessels in a diabetic. Now, acute coronary syndrome, ST elevation is where the angioplasty makes a difference, okay? But you, or the other thing is, what if you need a bypass? You need bypass, but you can't do it technically. You either don't have access, or for some reason, the person is too unstable to do a bypass surgery. Then you would do the angioplasty as an alternative. Oh, the other thing is DES. What's DES mean? Drug eluding stent. Drug eluding stent. Wow. Everolemus, sirolemus, pemecrolemus, sirolemus, pemecrolemus, tecrolemus. I still don't know how to pronounce them, whether I should be saying serolemus, tecrolemus, pemecrolemus, everolemus. This is the most amazing stuff. You coat this with this inhibiting drug, it stops the T cells, and you don't re stenose. Whoa! Lipid management, the strongest indication for statins. Anybody with any form of atherosclerotic disease, any form of atherosclerotic disease, whether it's cerebral disease, carotid disease, coronary disease, aortic disease, peripheral disease, uh, diabetics, particularly with an LDL greater than 100, LDL greater than 100, or LDL that's super high, super high LDLs, or 7.5%, that's supposed to be 7.5%, 10-year risk, a risk of having atherosclerotic disease in the next 10 years. So this one means, oh, we look at your age, your blood pressure, do you have diabetes, are you a smoker? Your age, your blood pressure, are you a smoker? And we say, calculate your risk. So we've determined that if over 10 years you have a 7.5% risk of developing coronary disease, you should be on a statin. You should be, this is a Vesalius, by the way, fantastic 16th century um, uh, anatomist. Uh, now, everybody who has cerebral vascular disease with a stroke at any LDL, and the reason why we're saying coronary disease equivalents is <clears throat> lipid management used to be based on multiple risk factors and an LDL. And there's a lot of fine point tuning of, are you a tobacco smoker? Do you have hypertension? Do you have a family history? And what's your LDL? And now we know that if you have bad vascular disease, if you have clogged up vessels at any level, from your head to your neck, to your heart, to your aorta, to your peripherals, you need to be in a statin. This is where statins really lower mortality. Now, where statins are much less clear is in primary prevention. So step three is only going to ask poor little intern junior resident level of people things that are super clear. And they're not going to work out with you. Should we be treating to a target? Or should we just be treating based on percentage risk? And the clearest questions are that goals are not clear. We had goals, then we said goals don't matter. Then we asked this namby-pamby thing that says, there is no goal, but it should be at least under 70. In diabetes, there is no goal, but it should be at least under 100. 
Ah, this is clear. Any atherosclerotic disease, you need a statin. Regardless of your LDL, you need a statin. Next, if your risk here is above 7.5%, we give you a statin. But if your benefit is greatest at 10% risk, you're great. Oh, and the coronary disease equivalents are saying all of those. Statins lower LDL. Cholestyramine lowers LDL. Cholestyramine, yeah. Gem fibers, all the fibric acid derivatives, they lower LDL. Ezetimibe lowers LDL. Niacin lowers LDL. Particularly like that flush. Woo, with the niacin. Woo. They all lower LDL. They all lower triglycerides. And uh, they all lower the total cholesterol. So, why the statins? Well, not only do statins have the greatest mortality benefit, it is really hard to demonstrate a mortality benefit with any of the others. So that's why it's statins and the other drugs are not clear. Now here's another unclarity. What if you don't get to under your 70 with a statin? And they'll say high intensity statin which is rosuvastatin or atorvastatin at a high dose, but since step three doesn't test dosing, they'll just call it high intensity. Rosuvastatin, atorvastatin, rosuvastatin, atorvastatin, rosuvastatin, atorvastatin, rosuvastatin, atorvastatin. High intensity statins at a high dose. Okay, here's the paradox. There's no clear benefit to adding a second drug. Second drug is out. All these years of saying add a second drug, no second drug. Okay, but if you're not at target, add azetamibe. What? There is no benefit of a second drug. Okay, but what if you're not a target? It is set them up. So you see what they said about having to be clear? It has to be clear. And the answer is, use a statin with everybody in, orthos, uh, uh, in uh, atherosclerotic disease. This next question is super clear. Adverse effects. That's why step three will go, yeah, we don't know what to do about targets. We don't know what to do about second drugs. Under 70 in most people. And adazetamibe, uh, what's the most common adverse effect is liver toxicity, not rhabdomyolysis. Liver toxicity is literally 10 times more common than rhabdomyolysis. Is there a routine recommendation to measure LFTs? Yes, you should be measuring LFTs when everybody who's on a statin. Is there a recommendation for routine CPKs? No. These drugs are the next biggest thing for the moment. PCSK9 inhibitors. Well, the PCSK9 is a receptor. It's a mechanism of being able to uh, pull LDL out of your bloodstream in your liver. What a great name is that. Boy, don't memorize that too much. But that's what it stands for. So these drugs will make it so that you will clear the okay, PCSK9 will block the clearance of LDL. PCSK9 blocks the clearance. So if you inhibit PCSK9, you will clear LDL from the blood. PCSK9 blocks the clearance of LDL. The PCSK9 inhibitor makes it so you clear the LDL. So these inhibitors clear the LDL. Kind of like a double negative. PCSK9 blocks the clearance. If you inhibit PCSK9, you'll clear it and you'll hear a huge increase in LDL being sucked out of the bloodstream. Its clearest indication is familial hyperlipidemias. And the mortality benefit in myocardial infarctions and coronary disease is fuzzy. It is fuzzy. So I am not saying yes to this at this time. PCSK9 inhibitors have, do have a clear answer, though. They lower LDL levels more than any other medication. So if the question were to say to you, which medication has the greatest effect upon lowering LDL that drops the number the most? It is the PCSK9 drugs. And why this becomes problematic is because if you sat there and said, but Conrad, you just said it's not treated to a target. Why are you treating to a target? You would be right. The question must be clear. And the guidelines are in flux. So if you are worried that you're going to fail because you can't answer, should there be a second drug or should you be treating to goals? You're not going to, because here I have just given you all the answers. You're going to get asked one of them, and you'll say it. 
Man develops erectile dysfunction after myocardial infarction. What's the most accurate, uh, what's the most common cause of developing erectile dysfunction? The most common cause of erectile dysfunction is actually not beta blockers. It's being nervous. Actually, I had a friend of mine who's a chief of medicine uh, at a big hospital, and uh, he goes, uh, I know it's in my head, but nothing's happening. I'm too nervous to have sex. I'm afraid I'm going to die. I'm afraid I'm going to have syncope. I'm anxious. Is it the beta blockers? No, because I stopped it. I still was having erectile dysfunction. Uh, you're having erectile dysfunction, you're going to start sildenafil, and you have to stop nitrates because nitrates are a vasodilator, and sildenafil is a vasodilator, and between both of these, it will treat your primary pulmonary hypertension and open your pulmonary artery and will also cause syncope. I wish I could be more clear on the statin and the LDL thing and PCSK9s, and the minute I'm clear, the minute it is clear, you will be the first to know. I'm not the kind of guy to withhold anything.